the reality is, is we're in an incredibly proliferated market when it comes to content. So therefore, anyone that is not what they see every day, actually, is it, it used to be a weakness, is now a strength. Tupuake ia i te tai rāwhiti a Aotearoa e rangi ai a nei ko tāna mahi e he noho tahi ki te whakari te kirimana i ko e ngā ratonga nui o te ao i roto i te ao pāpā ho ko Amazon, ko National Geographic, ko Fremantle Media te hunga e ko rero ki āke nei. Nō rei rei tiwi, ko ia nei te ko rero me te roa ngāke o ngā whakāroa Bailey Mackie e pāna ki tōna whakatupuranga mai i te reo irirangi aiwi ki te taone nui o ngā whetu o te ao ara ko Hollywood. Bailey Mackie, Indigenous 100. Bailey Mackie, tēnā koe. Tēnā koe. Nau mai ki te rau o take take. Um, so, aside from being a millionaire, what do you do now? <laughs> oh, I wish. Um, <laughs> so... How, how do you describe what you do to other people? Okay, cool. Um, well, I guess I contribute to Māori development. Um, and I guess the primary way I do that uh, is through storytelling. So probably a long-winded way of saying I'm the CEO of Pango uh, Productions. Um, I sit on a number of boards, Ngāti Pirau Holdings, uh, which is the commercial uh, entity of uh, Ngāti Pirau. Um, I'm on the steering group for the New Zealand Pavilion, Dubai 2020. <laughs> Um, which kind of has a real trade and commerce focus uh, into the UAE. Um, and I'm on the Prime Minister's Business Council, Business Advisory Council, with 12 other uh, New Zealand uh, CEOs from, from different sectors. And, and the main one? And the main one <laughs> is, uh, and the most stressful, is I'm the president of Ngāti Pro East Coast Rugby. <laughs> So, um, the most rewarding thing. Oh, uh, I'm still waiting on the ROI, um, <laughs> but, but hopefully we'll see, soon see. So. Hina fakara bo boto. Heha te tino fainga a pamo. Me ki, well, me huri o ki te reo pakia tuatahi. The main aim of pango uh, is to influence the world through Maori storytelling. Right. Um, I have, you know, kua roa au i roto i e nei tua huatanga, uh, neke atu i te rua te koutou, uh, i roto i ngā mahi pāpāho. Um, and so I've been 20 years in broadcasting, or over 20 years now, and kind of just think in the last sort of six months, I've kind of figured it all out. So, pango... Um, hey, hang on, so you said you're only katahi no koe ka, katahi no te kapa kataka mai? In the I, last six months? Yeah, I, I think so. I think so because I have kind of figured out a whole lot of things of, of why... Talk to me about that. What does that mean? Well, probably the easiest way to explain it, bro, and it's something I've just recently gone through with our staff, is kind of, you know, the content game for me has five Ps. One's your purpose, what, why you do it. And as I said at the beginning... For me, I want to contribute to improving uh, Māori life. Mm -hmm. Ngāti Pro life, uh, Tūhoi life, Rungu Whakata life, Māori life. And my primary means of doing that has been through, I guess, what I do as a day job, which is um, a storyteller. Um, but so most people kind of think we, we, you know, you're a producer of a TV programme. But actually, what's really going on underneath that, like, how are you influencing kind of a bigger purpose in life? And, and, and everything we do at Pango kind of feeds that purpose of yep. trying to change the world through Māori storytelling. Um, and, and I'm big on kind of the, world's, the world knows us for the haka, world knows us for once we're warriors, it now knows us for taika waititi. Um, but actually, we're a, a dynamic people and we have many faces and we have many realities, diverse realities, um, and I think it's important for the world to be able to see kind of the whole gambit. So the first P being purpose, 
Uh, second P being people, which is relationships, um, uh, networks, uh, managing people. Um, uh, third P is production, kind of what 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 skill you have. I guess you and I were lucky um, that we kind of came through as reporters and, and journalists and, and you get a kind of taste of all areas of, of, of kind of the production process. So how well are you uh, in any one of those areas? Um, fourth one is passion. Um, you gotta put your heart into things. You gotta get a, what gets you out of bed on those rainy days. Um, and the fifth one, and I think this is probably the secret sauce for us is perception is what's really going on. What's really going on in, in this, um, this TV show, uh, what's really going on in the market, what's really going on in New Zealand, what's really going on in the world. And, and that for me kind of is the big, um, you kind of wrap that up and that, that's kind of what we do. So how do you make, because you're in LA a lot, Mm -hmm. Right, you're peddling your wares. I just got back this morning, Jules. Just, Thanks for reminding me. <laughs> was that business or anyway? We'll, we'll get into that. But you're in, you're there like a lot. How do yeah. you make them give a damn? Because I know you talked about Tyker and the All Blacks and Hucker and all that kind of stuff. Yeah. But how do you make them give a damn about what you're doing, the stories you're making? Oh, oh here's a really good story, right? So I went. Uh, I was in LA probably about six years ago. One of the first times I'd kind of been there to pitch on my own, and um, I'd, I'd got an agent. And we're on our way to a meeting on 405, heading out to the valley. And I remember thinking, uh, I had a long sleeve shirt on and I didn't kind of think it through, but I remember thinking, oh, my um, tāmoko was covered. And I sort of said to him, he's a Jewish dude, I said, hey, um, is my race ever gonna be a problem in any of these meetings? And he looked at me and laughed and he said, of course it is. <laughs> but but I'm your agent because you're like no one else I have on my books. Right. And essentially his message was, is you have to stand on your truth. And I think the reality is, is we're in an incredibly proliferated market when it comes to content. So therefore anyone that is not what they see every day, actually is it, it used to be a weakness, is now a strength. So for me, standing on my truth, I'm a Māori boy, brought up on the east coast of North Island uh, in a little country at the, just north of Antarctica um, is an incredibly uh, different narrative and at times I think powerful too. So, so how do you, because this is, this is high pressure situation, right? You're going into a, and we'll talk about Nancy Prado Senate, we'll come back to what <laughs> makes you the way you are, because I think Capri. there are some unique kind of things in there that makes you different, yep. I think, not just being Māori, but also the way that you, you do your shows and the way that you produce things and, you, and your unique perspective. But this is high pressure stuff going into Ngā Kamupene Nui o Te Ao, and mahi ana i ngā kaupapa i runga i tipurangi, i runga i te pokawakanta. What is your approach? What are you thinking before you get in the door to try and nail this thing and go, right, this is how it's going to happen, I'm going to get this thing done and I'm going to get this deal? Yeah, it's, it's weird because I think I always get a lot of feedback that I'm, I'm, I'm really good at pitching and really good at selling, selling things. Um, for me, I, I, I think I'm really good at being myself. And, you know, again, to go back to what that agent said, standing on my truth. And I've kind of always had the opinion, and I think it was a Dave Grohl quote where he said, you know, you're better, be, you're better to be hated for what you believe in than to be loved for what you don't. And, and I'm a believer that, like, I genuinely um, think that actually, um, if I have to be any other version than myself, then that's not somebody I want to work with, or that's not a company I want to work for, or, um, and if I have to compromise any of the kind of values I have, or any kind of the perspectives that I've built, um, then then I'm out. Yeah. And you know, that can kind of be seen as ruthless or that can, because, you know, I've pulled out of some big things and I've pulled out of some big things recently um, based on the fact that actually, you know, um, money will come if you keep making the right decisions and success comes um, if you keep making the right decisions. So. so you've been quoted as being a master relationship builder. I believe that's a direct quote from Mr B. Mackey. <laughs> <For myself>. um, <laughs> <laughs> I 
I think you know it's it's one of the P's where I, which is people and I think. Man, no, he had nui. He had the pukinga noa nei. Yeah. Man, I, I legitimately, I love life and, and I love people. I like weirdly, I like sitting in airports and and people watching and kind of guessing what 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 that person's story is. Um, I'm famous for talking to people on planes next to me and really like getting involved. Uh, some people hate that. Um, but no, I, I just got a genuine interest in people. Um, I actually wanted to study anthropology um, at university and, and um, actually I probably did study anthropology at university. <laughs> 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 just eat what we No, no, I, was, I, I should put it this way. I was enrolled in anthropology uh, at university. Um, I'm not sure I made a lot of the classes. Um, but, but if I had my time again, I think I probably would have got into anthropology because I legitimately, um, you know, I, I dig people. That's what you'd do if you weren't doing... CEO of Pango. Yeah, uh, well, maybe, but, but I think it'd be doing something. Yeah. Probably similar to you, Julian. Like, you, you had an incredible career in broadcasting. Like, we're probably cut from the same cloth in that regard, in that we, we want to contribute to the amelioration of our people. Mm. You were doing it in broadcasting, now you've chosen to do it in iwi development and, um, and things like that. So I think I'd probably be a little bit similar if I wasn't in... in, in in broadcasting or, or yep. whatever we call it now, um, then I'd, I'd be uh, probably involved in, in iwi development uh, in some way. Da rere ki hoki ko muri o tawa mahara ki te wā i a koe tamariki ana. Kia ora. Whānau mai koe i tūranga nui a kiwa? Uh, I whānau mai au um, e, uh, i tūranga nui a kiwa. Uh, Whitu te kau mā ono, uh, te tau, um, Ko, ko oku iwi, ko Ngāti Parau, um, tū hoi me rongo whakata, te taha ki taku pāpa, uh, Ngāti Parau me rongo whakata, uh, te taha ki taku māma uh, uh, nō tū hoi, uh, nō reira waimari au pakeke mai au uh, te kato waku kui a kaumātua uh, kōrero Māori, ne? i kōrero Māori. Ahau ko kāri i kōrero uh, ki ngā tamariki. Um, so I, I was really fortunate there. Uh, you know, grew up with um, te reo Māori, um, really prevalent in our house, but not spoken to us. I think that was kind of a symptom of colonisation. Mm. Um, grandparents um, spoke Māori amongst themselves, and, and it was kind of their language was the attitude. It wasn't kind of the language of the new world, I guess, was their view. And, um, you know, they'd been uh, strapped at school for speaking Māori. Um, and I, and you know, I was even there was a bit of resistance when I took Maori as a subject um, when I yeah, got to I? high school. I just think, uh, you know, again, just the result of colonisation. Yeah. So, so uh, 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 um, so my parents, uh, my my dad, uh, Henry mm. uh, Henare was a. Uh, a sharer and my mother, um, Tangiwai, um, she also worked in the sharing shed, so they kind of met there and had my sister and myself. Uh, my sister's two years younger than me, but they must have separated when I was about three and a half, four. Um, so um, I ended up, uh, me and my sister actually ended up in a home, uh, social welfare home in Gisborne, probably for the best part of two years. Um, and, you know, to be honest, I, I actually have pretty fond memories. Really? Uh, yeah, pretty fond memories tell, tell of me that. Tell me about it. Because, I, and it's, it's tough now because I see a lot of the Oranga Tamariki child yeah. uplift stuff. Look, I just remember we had three meals a day. Um, you know, the place was warm. It had one of the first trampolines in Gisborne. Um, and um, I do remember like it was really like disciplined um, and it was really strict and, and over the years in recent years I've actually met people that were in the same orphanage. I'd, I'd love some photos at the time um, but I remember Mrs Boyack who was a like a kind of classic sort of mis headmistress lady who was really, and I, I remember getting the strap and having to sit on the, um, 
this uh, mat outside her um, uh, her office for surprisingly talking too much, Jules. Um, <laughs> um, so that, it, that was pretty evident early on, right? That was pretty evident early on. Well, uh, where does that come from? Uh, the talk, probably, uh, I don't know, like, uh, again, probably a love of people, right? Yeah. And, you know, wanting to create relationships. I think one of the things is, is kind of when you go through, when you're the child of parents that have separated, and after that period, I kind of, then my dad came and got me and my sort of paternal grandparents um, looked after me. Um, G.I., or he was Henari Senior, and my grandmother, Myra, kind of bought me and my sister up in Kaiti from about five or six. You said G.I., why was he called G.I.? Uh, he was a returned serviceman from Māori Battalion. Oh, um, to Māori. Yeah. Tukau Māori. And he actually, like, um, uh, was a, a bit of a hero in our community. He'd been... Um, but but I guess also had post traumatic stress disorder, so we kind of uh, you know had the effects of that in our household. So didn't really kind of deal with the impact of having been to war as a. I think he lied. So he was 16, right? So 16 year old, you get you get to war. And his one of his stories was he, his best friend gets blown away on the first day they're there, uh -huh. and so 16 years old and travelling to the other side of the world and then losing your best friend and. And I guess he kind of drowned a lot of his um, uh, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder and, and alcohol. And, and you remember that when you were... Oh, I, I remember it um, vividly because kind of he would be... He'd, he'd drink most nights. Um, look, he was a good man, uh, you know, wasn't abusive or anything to us kids. But I guess, you know, having alcohol around all the time... Um, just wasn't the best environment to grow up in. I'm trying to, just trying to get a sense of all this because I think it's these things occur for a reason and they have impacts, right? And I'm trying to think of how that all kind of comes together and what you're doing now. Yeah. It seems to me that there's almost a sense that that childhood, <laughs> you know, your, your grandfather being a hero, your mum and dad splitting up, you being in a home, coming out of a home again, being with your grandparents, it leads to certain things happening in your life, right? Uh, have you thought about kind of the lessons that um, happened at that time that lead to you being... Yeah, what you want to. So, my grandmother Myra was the most amazing woman. Like she was, my dad always says that she was ten times tougher than my grandfather, who was the war oh. hero, right? Oh. So, she had thirteen children. Um, I don't even know how many grandchildren, like first cousins, I got. But, um, and so she brought me and my sister up, and she brought us up with lots of love. Um, she she was a teetotaler. She'd become a Christian. Oh. Uh, well, she used to read from the good book on a Sunday and then the bad book on a Monday to Saturday, which was the best bets and turf digest. <laughs> so she, she didn't mind the old gamble on the old horses. <laughs> but, Treat them uh, in chapter three, mate, verse 13. Uh, actually, this is a true story. <laughs> this is a true story. I, um, <laughs> I still remember her TAB account number <laughs> <laughs> off by heart because she used to ring them every day. <laughs> and the, well, actually, I shouldn't say that part, but I was going to say that they're the pin codes from all my cards now, <laughs> at different sequences of her. Um, but, but actually, she, she was uh, the most caring woman, um, and so ha had this element of love. But, but I think like any kid, you kind of long for your parents as yeah. well. And so my dad was a sharer and led an incredibly uh, nomadic life. Uh, my mum wasn't around for a lot of the years that I was kind of, you know, my formative years. So, so that was really tough because I think, uh, you know, a young boy um, wants the love of their mother. Um, and, and I think may, maybe part of the talking in that um, and part of my, you know, the, you talk about master uh, relationship builder is, had to do with the fact that kind of I had this big presence that wasn't in my life. So at times growing up, you overcompensate for that by, you know, wanting everyone to, to accept you or want everyone to like you. So, Do you so, remember doing that? Do you remember that being... Not, not consciously, but now that, um, now that you're I'm supposedly it. older and wiser, Jules, <laughs> like, um, you know, you kind of look back at things and, and you know, you, you walk into certain scenarios and you kind of want to be the, the biggest personality in the room or, um, you know, those types of things. So, yeah, I think that all helped shape okay. who I am. I think the other thing is that when I was... a when I started at Intermediate, whatever age that was, my dad came back and kind of bought a house 100 metres from my grandmother and I went back to live with him and 
uh, you know, kind of just had sort of total freedom and sort of, you know, was able to kind of bring myself up from yep. 13. And, and, and what that meant was, I just think, became a survivor. Became a survivor uh, from a young age and pretty self-sufficient. And, you know, when it comes to leaving home, then you, you've been looking after yourself since you were 13. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So, no way tamariki ana. He ha taiwi tino hia hia ai hai mahi mau e tō paka he tanga. Uh, well, kua ki ake rau, pakeke mai au i roto i ngā mahi kutsi hipi. Uh, no reira, koira pe te mahi tuatai. Uh, e, uh, so I grew up in the shearing sheds and like my dad, I wanted to be a shearer. Um, but, um, you know, kind of, and, and, and that's an environment that works 12 hours a day. So five o'clock start, five o'clock finish. Um, so if the sh sometimes you'd be up at three o'clock um, to be able to get your gear ready and, and travel to the shearing shed. So real awesome work ethic and, you know, like most kids, you look up to your dad. Uh, so I wanted to be that. But really pivotal in my life, two things happened. One was I, I got an award, um, which was a Pepsi can that, that was a radio. And... Uh, it was an award I got at Kaiti School, and I remember in the evenings at my grandmother's, like listening under the blankets to a, like uh, like a, a radio station that was in Auckland, and and in those days you could actually pick up like Los Angeles yeah, yeah. on on the wireless, and I'd be under the blankets, and I was just blown away that there could be someone in a studio thousands of miles away or thousands of kilometres away sort of having this intimate conversation with me. So so, so I knew that from a young age that if sharing didn't work out, then maybe broadcasting or, or, or something like that could have been uh, something for me. So I want this to be a real uh, honest conversation, right? So, so I'll be honest with you. Yeah. So when I first met you, Actually, no, we won't go there. <laughs> <laughs> when, I, when I met, met you after a certain yeah. uh, social in Hawke's Bay, yeah. you were, at the time, I think, working at Radio Ngāti Pro. You were broadcasting Radio Ngāti Pro. Yep. I think you hitchhiked to Auckland, because you and I both started at Takarere on the same day. I, I, I mean, there's a precursor to all of this. Because <laughs> uh, I could be, th be thrown under the bus. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> what I was going to say was, I thought you were rough as guts. Yeah, yeah. So, so two things, well, let me sort of preface this whole conversation by saying the other thing that seriously impacted me, um, other than that kind of radio can um, moment, was uh, in the Ngamanu Kōrero, uh, the Kōrimako speech contest, uh, which you and I were both contestants of in 1993. Um, and unfortunately for me, um, there were three judges from Te Aute. Uh, <laughs> Which, uh, which, which meant I came second uh, to you. But actually, what it realised, uh, what it actually sort of gave me was the sense of actually I had a gift for storytelling, communication, and for communication and and for tr trying to get a message across. Clearly, um, I didn't have the influence of the judges, uh, but that's another thing. So then, what was really interesting, if that was 1993. Mm. Then fast forward sort of seven years to I think the beginning of 2001 or maybe the end of 2000 when um, the next time I saw you was we were both applying for the one job on Te Karere. And what was, what was really interesting was, and I remember thinking, um, so what happened was I'd sent my CV in and I got a phone call from Moadi Stafford, the producer, who said, look, Bailey, um, I just want to, you know, and I was thinking, wow. I'm in. I, I'm in. I'm in. <laughs> and Marty Stafford was like, uh, look, Bailey, we've shortlisted, uh, we've got 21 applications. We've shortlisted three, and you're not one of them. <laughs> and, and he said, but I wrote a really creative cover letter, and he said to me that um, we, we, we will give you an interview as well as the three people we've shortlisted. We're flying them in. Um, would you make your own way to Auckland? Uh, and I said, yeah, I'll make my own way. And he said, look, you've got to be here tomorrow at four o'clock. Your interview's then. And I was like, okay, cool. So I hitchhiked. I, I hitchhiked. Um, I was staying in Tiki Tiki or staying in Rangi Tiki at the time. So I hitchhiked um, to Auckland. And I remember getting 
is it Manga Tafiri, which yeah. is about an hour or yeah. so. And I rang, uh, collect in those days, to do a tipuki who I'd gone to school with and sort of said to him, hey bro, could, I, I, need, a I suit. need a suit. I need a suit to go to this interview. <laughs> and he said, yeah, yeah, I'll bring you one. Uh, only problem was he was wearing it because he'd just been <laughs> at, a, at a blues function. And uh, he gave me a suit outside the outside TVNZ. I went in and had sweat patches and he, he's shorter than me. <laughs> and so I looked like Poindexter because <laughs> I'd gone in and, uh, and, and my pants were like were too short and the shirt was too, and it was rough as guts. And I remember when I walked in and my heart sunk when I saw you sitting there. And I was thinking, oh, not this guy again. <laughs> not this guy. And, uh, I'm and trying not to make this insular, but it's, it's very it's, entertaining. I'm just wondering who's been interviewed. <laughs> it's, it's just, you got me on to talk about you. Um, <laughs> but uh, I know what's happening here. Um, but, but actually, I remember sitting down, and I sat down to you, and I don't know if you remember this, but you said to me, oh, um, you know, one of the big problems, and I, and I, I recognise it for what it was. I know what you're going to say, and I do remember, yeah. It, it was a power play, Jules, and uh, you said to me, oh man, the biggest problem if I get this job is I've only got three suits. <laughs> and I was thinking to myself, I barely have three pairs of undies. <laughs> I'm not even worried about uh, whether or not uh, I get this job. But I, I've got to give it to Moati mm. um, and Tinny Molyneux, I think, who was the pers other person that was instrumental is what they did was rather than appoint one person they recognized that both of us um had skill and talent and but gave us both a job yeah. and and i i pretty much realized straight away that with you around i was never going to have a future as a presenter <laughs> uh, so i had to cut, try and cut a track uh to being a producer so and, no 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 Hey, kai hotu. Uh, I think there were a e couple more here on my uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, but Bono, because you, you were, I remember you saying uh, you were pretty, you were pretty keen to be a producer at the time. You wanted yeah, to yeah, learn to yeah. produce, and that was what you said when you went to Māori TV too. I want to yeah, produce. You want to produce? Uh, look, and I, I think from Te Karere, I I got a random phone call uh, one day from Mel Reed at TV3 and she offered me uh, uh, a sports reporting job on 3 News and when I went over there there were so many people that were interested in presenting again and I was like oh man there's such an easier path to being a producer plus also like I figured out kind of where the power lay like you know um, presenting's cool um, the downside of presenting is obviously fame yeah. I reckon um, but actually producing you know nobody knows who, who you are like but yet you can have so much say in, in what happens so I, I, I guess I was kind of like you know understood really on and, and, and by the way um, I started the same day as usual so I was like the Māori Ken doll was basically got rolled out on the same day and I was like mate I got no show of becoming a presenter with this guy around. Let's stop talking about us. Um, when did you know when did you first know? Was it that uh, infamous time when you were watching the Bathurst 500 that quickly, <laughs> quickly became the Bathurst 20? No, when, no. when did you know Etaia e koe te hautu and na te hai perai? Yeah, that's an interesting question. Like, Because um, this, this is what they, leads to you coming yeah, to Yeah, no, no. Um, I'll tell you one thing. Um, so... Timato te karere, mm. mai te karere hareau ki TV3, um, hei kairi poata hā kina kina, mutu anau i reire hareau ki Shortland Street. Um, Timato i reire hei kaiawhina Māori uh, i rotu i ngā mahi, um, hareau ki reire te ako i ngā mahi tuhi tuhi, ka mutu ka hareau ki Māori TV, uh, whakata Māori. Um, so, when I went to Māori TV, this is an interesting story. I remember um, I rang Tawani Rangiho and she said, oh, she, oh, she'd left a message and so I rang her back and she said, oh, um, Bailey, do you want to come over and be um, the executive producer of sport? I was like, yeah. And I said, who's in my team? And she said, oh, it'll be just you and Julian Wilcox. And I said, okay, cool. So technically, I'd be his boss. <laughs> and she said, yes, you would be. I was like, okay, cool, I'll take it now. <laughs> and, uh, 
but I remember stopping the car and sort of um, Googling executive producer. Like, I was like, how, how what does that be, mean? How, mate, and the, that's the thing about producing. There's no manual yeah. and there's no one right way, right? And, and all you can do is kind of, kind of break it down into that matrix uh, I said earlier. And I, I sort of did that quite early on. So when did I realise I could produce, bro? I think it must have been pretty early on like in those Takarere days that I knew that I wanted to be kind of the key influencer um, in whatever content proposition I was involved in. So I know, and we'll talk about code, right? Yeah. But there's a interesting situation you and I find ourselves in. We're on a plane, North America slash Canada, yeah. Yeah. to broadcast the Māori rugby tour of Canada, Churchill Cup. Yep. Yeah. There's no plugs or anything like that, or there's no, hardly anything set up, and you're the one that's supposed to be responsible for it. And I remember thinking at the time we're on a lolly trip. Engari ko koe te tahi tanga tahi fa'ka pono ane tahi koe ngā mea katoa. Ache ache ngā rau 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 o te rau hai ringa moio tunu au i te fa'karo koe tahi a. Yeah, take a tahi. Um, Taki mai so te rau here, ihe te rau fa'ka pono o e tahi koe ngā mea katoa. Pakeke mai taku tamariki tanga. Yeah. Te wai wehe taku mama, ki hoki anō ki taku kōrero. Uh, te tamaiti moke moke. Um, e, e whakātu ana ki te aukataia ngā mahi katoa. Um, <clears throat> so, I think, Jules, like, you know, to answer the question is, is I guess that a lot, lot of times, particularly when you're younger, like, that confidence is kind of false bravado and... And, and, and overcompensation for for being able to do things that you actually you're not equipped to do, or or actually, because I, I actually think that there was probably a genuine belief that I could do anything. Um, I recently just spoke to um, a cousin of mine who was at boarding school when we were at school, and I used to write her letters, like you know, and and she basically told me some of the letters that I'd wrote and was like that I'd play for East Coast and we'd win a championship, that I'd um, perform for Waihidere and go to, you know, Atimpes or Matatini and that I'd become a TV producer. And, and that's kind of like pretty incredible mm. that kind of all those things have happened in life. And I, um, so I think a lot of it is overcompensation. Um, uh, it is a, a little bit of kind of faking it till you make it, but, but also, uh, like just, just you know, I, I, I guess initially kind of put out that I knew what I was doing, but actually then ca having the talent, I guess, to catch up and then sort of be in front of that confidence and, and be in front of that ego, because ego is a big part of that. And um, So talk to me about that, is that, <clears throat> because some people find that a little bit off. They don't like ego. <laughs> They do say, oh, you know, yeah, he's got an ego and yeah, all, yeah, like, yeah. all this kind of stuff. Was that ever an issue for you or not? Oh, massively so. Like, yeah. hugely so. So um, in the last couple of years, like, I've been able to sort of, um, I've, I've done some sort of personal development and really been able to kind of look at the good and bad of kind of my upbringing, uh, what that meant. But, but we all have an ego, right? And... <clears throat> unless we can understand it, um, it can become all-consuming. Mm. And I think for me, one of the big lessons is, is that, oh man, I've made some massive mistakes. So when I was at Māori TV, um, I, and one of the beauties of that time, Jules, is, mate, I was Googling executive producer, like, um, we were writing our own script. Like, you could legitimately have a TV, TV show idea, and then next week it'd, you'd be on air. Yeah. And, you know, we spent hundreds of hours in the studio. Um, we were allowed to kind of make mistakes and some beautiful things came out of that, that period. And so uh, I was the head of sports. So we, we went from zero sport to having, you know, New Zealand's best acknowledged sports show code um, through to having free to air rugby league, um, rugby, um, David Tour, boxing, the breakers. These are all, um, you know, pretty significant um, milestones and 
you, and I was riding high um, and decided I wanted to leave and had like five massive bulls in there and none of them came through and they all fell on my head and I remember at the time it was an incredibly humbling period that I had to um, effectively, like, you know, I'd been the, on a golden run uh, at Māori TV and thought the world would be at my feet but um, it wasn't and I remember like sort of being broke and having to ring a friend of ours, Tianga Nathan, and ask him for weekend work. And, you know, from going, being the man um, and having all these hit shows to suddenly being the weekend producer on Takaya on Māori News was, was, uh, was an incredibly humbling time. And I, I just remember it taught, taught me a lot about kind of how I had, had acted and and, and treated people as well. So um, it taught me a massive lesson. And it taught me to be grateful. Um, nothing's ever given. Um, everything's earned, and so, including luck. Um, so I'll always be grateful for that period because one of the things that happened was code got outsourced and it went to a friend of ours and not me. And I remember thinking at the time that, you know, I had a sense of entitlement that it should have been mine. But it was actually the best thing that ever happened to me because, what? well, I went on um, to, it forced me to actually make other decisions. And thankfully, I, I, I um, got a phone call from Julie Christie, right. like <coughs> randomly. So um, let, let's talk about it. Yeah. Because Julie Christie, Christie at the time is, well, she was the queen. She was, mm -hmm. she was the chief of New Zealand production yep. uh, content. Um, her shows, the most watched shows in the country, all that kind of stuff. So when she calls you, because yep. you've had a relationship with Julie for a long time now, yep. right? And she basically mentors you. Yep. Why? You know, uh, Māori boy, yeah, no, no, Well, no, well, I don't think she so I kind of rang me up because she was going to mentor me. Um, what happened was Kath Graham um, was at TVNZ and she, um, Julie had an idea to do a show around, she'd done Pioneer House, She'd done Colonial House, and then she kind of wanted to do a Māori sort of version of that, sort of a time period, but kind of needed a Māori producer on it. And I think she had the option of some more senior producers. Um, and then Kath Graham, I think, gave her my name and said, look, he's a younger guy. And Julie had seen Code, really liked it, and even though it wasn't in the reality genre, thought that it might be a good opportunity to... Um, try someone different. So went over there and that show was One Land, uh, six one hours, and that was made for TVNZ, big landmark series. Um, and then kind of started, uh, um, what happened was I, I kind of started my own company, Black Ink, um, and then we did One Land, and then I think I did Top Town for her as well. And then um, um, she just, I, you know, I get a phone call and she says, look, why don't I buy half of Black Ink and we go into business together and, you know, I'll, I'll show you the ropes. Did, did you know that the world had changed at that time? Because that, that, that was a big deal. Oh, it was right? a... Well, I'll tell you what... big deal, bro. I'll, well, I'll tell go you what... Go by Nuitera. They don't like an item. No, no, I, I, I te I'll, I'll tell you what was a big deal, Jules, is because at the time I was trying to buy a house and effectively the deal would give me the money mm. to be able to buy... My first time. And so just to be clear, money's not a motivator for you, right? No, nah, money's just byproduct of, right. of doing what I love, bro. Okay. And uh, But I, I have to say at that time, you know, you have a young family. Yeah, yeah. Um, if somebody says to you, look, I'm going to give you the opportunity to, to buy a house for doing what I love, um, then I was going to take that. But more than that, um, w what it did give me, and I, I probably didn't realise it at the time, gave me a front seat into the business side. Because we work in a creative business and in creativity, there's a lot of blurred lines. Yep. What's not blurred are financials and legals. And that's just something that a lot of creatives don't, don't fully understand and don't, don't understand the business side of what we do. And, and obviously having somebody that was so proficient, um, who was not only respected here, like I went to France to MIP the very first time and just, she was meeting the biggest producers and and uh, network executives in the world, yeah. and 
and, and I was just sitting there like, oh, what? Yeah. And, and really started to put together the matrix of how this business really works and, and, and the role we can play in it. So you, you, you talked to me at the start about the five P's, right? Yep. And telling Māori stories, Māori yep. narrative yep. Um, to help influence and change the world. Yeah. So then you go away and you develop something called the GC. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so, right, so, and for those that don't know the GC, and we've got an Indigenous audience, right? But the GC is a program that talks about Māori who are based on the Gold Coast and yep. just their, their everyday kind of lives. What were you trying to achieve? What was I thinking? <laughs> <laughs> well, what, why do it? It seemed like something I, completely I, I, different to what you were trying to do at the time because you talked about, you know, trying to tell Māori stories and you were, you were being lambasted by some people for making uh, this content wasn't Māori, they said. Yeah, and, and to be fair, the GC was a tough time, man. Like, when it came out, it was tough, and, and I'll get to that. But, but what I noticed, though, like, I had a son, uh, my eldest boy, um, till I was brought up on the Gold Coast, right? right? And what I noticed while I was over there was this incredibly confident diaspora of young Māori um, who were, in their own way, like, really striving to better themselves. And so for me, one of the interesting things about that is I wanted to tell that story, but I wanted to tell it in prime time. And the thing was, is that I knew that like, um, I had to tell it in a way that wasn't gonna come across as a lesson. Um, and so, you know, through that show, we were able to talk about big, big Māori concepts like cultural disconnection, whāngai. Um, and th the problem was, is that just, it gets it got audience. lost in nefs and aunties. It, well, and people, it, it, and people, well, saw, people saw it, you know, the bikinis and the tops yeah. off and all that kind of stuff. Do you honestly believe, though, looking back on it now, yeah. that that's what you achieved? You know what? Yes, 100%. And I'll tell you why. Because um, legitimately, I think that, well, for starters, it went for three series. Yeah. So the audience, rightly or wrongly, agreed. Um, but more than that, though, bro, like, I've, I've met people over the years who have set me down and told me the impact the show had on them and were able to see themselves in that, um, in that, in, in that series. And I think too, Jules, one of the other things too is that I'm not sure it got lost in nefs and aunties, but I actually think it was all part of um, the whole narrative. That actually, that was their language and at the heart of any culture's language and at the heart of young Māori kind of partying up on the GC is um, is the way that they want to speak and, and the way that they want to talk. So, no, no, I, I definitely think that, um, and, and for the mere fact that it, 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 it stopped a certain um, amount of people to actually sit down and have that conversation about how they felt about it, mm. For me, that did, did their job, and and whether you hated it or loved it, um, ultimately you had an opinion on it. And I think as content makers, that that's that's all all, all you can do, right? Is yeah. force people to have an opinion on it. I pa ma mai koe, in a tau kupu ai. Oh, bro, tino pa ma mai. No. E e hara i te um, wa ngawari, um, e tino tau maha, tau maha um, motoku fano. Um, Tau maha no moku hoki, uh, e hara i te mahi māma. Um, I know that, like, that was a tough time, man, because, um, you know, I always say, like, you know, when you cre create content, it's like putting your undies on the line. And it's like, you know, because it was such a high rater, it had high visibility, it was incredibly controversial. So, you know, it would split, it split people, it split my family. Yeah. You know, so it wasn't... Um, uh, and, and you know, it was interesting people that supported it and people that didn't. Um, so, uh, yeah, no, nah, it, it was a tough time, Jules. So, when, when you start Power mm. and you're, you're starting to go all over the world, you're going to film festivals and you're mm. going, as I say, you're going to LA and you're talking to, to some really influential people, some of the best producers in the world, and, and you're still working with Jewelry. <clears throat> what was the impact on you? of all that time, and I'm, I'm mainly getting to whānau, I, I don't know, pē herai nei tō ruku hōhuru ki te nei puna, ne? I te mea, herai te puna ngā mā. Nā, nā. So, when you're doing all this work, what has been the impact on your life and on others that you care about, particularly kids, hmm. of you spending a lot of time working overseas in this business, which is 
tough. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, tough, right? Tough on tough on on the kids, um, and I think tough on the kids from the point of view that um, they uh, uh, ch- children are, I think. Children just want time, right? More than anything else, they just want your time. So I guess the pursuit of my career has uh, meant that I haven't been around as much as I I could have been. So what do you think about that now? Knowing Um, that and acknowledging that? Oh, well, I try. You know, like, I'm a work in progress. Um, I make time... Uh, and, and to be fair, I think I've balanced it up a lot in recent times. But I saw Jason Whittyheader receive an award, Multi Business Person of the Year award yep. from University of Auckland, and he and he had some real pertinent words to say, which were, you know, don't be so focused on the destination that you don't take your children on the journey. And that was a regret of his, and I hope he doesn't mind me kind of saying it. But uh, and that was really sage advice. So for me, I, I ensure that there are times that I just set aside that, uh, you know, kind of ki ngā tamariki, so. So, but, but I think for all of us, Jules, people who are committed to their careers, that, you know, it's a, it's a really tough thing. Mm. And, and something that, to be honest, I'm, I, I grapple with today and will grapple with um, because, yeah, children just want our time. If the push came, he pata hanga hohu nui tene me pena pe te kōrero. Kamu tu hia nui ki ki ata rongo i o fakaru he pā nagi te ni kai papa ta te mea um, ki te puta te tahi wero nui e ki ana ki te kōrero e, e, e pā pare i te rākau papa ka pā mama yaku tamariki. I'm just wondering if you know in your mind and in your heart that if you get to a point where a big offer or a big proposition comes to you and you know you're going to be away that you're not going to have much time are you prepared to make the call or is your career so kind of encompassing that you you're in a position where you've got to do it because you know this is what you have to do no i've already made that decision and that uh so in 2016 i think we sold sidewalk karaoke to Fremantle. Um, and at that time I had my agent, you know, I had loads of people saying that I needed to move to Los Angeles, um, and, and I didn't, um, because of the situation with my children, um, so, um, and, <clears throat> and I just got back from LA this morning, and, and again, people were like, oh, you need to move up, you need to, you know, do this, you do that, and, um, but my view is, you know, I want to change the world from here. Okay. Um, I think um, the, the world's changed enough to be able to do that. Technology uh, means that we can contribute, um, you know, in a fulfilling way f- from Aotearoa. And, and mate, we live in paradise. Um, well, those outside of Ngāti Pirau, I don't know. But, <laughs> but those of us uh, within Ngāti Pirau, uh, <laughs> Uh, we live in paradise, but no, I, I'm a big believer that, <clears throat> like, you know, I've already made that decision, and it comes up probably once or twice a year. You know, opportunities to move back to LA, and you know, and everyone says I'm built for LA and that I love it, and <clears throat> um, I do love it, but it's also, you know, it can be a soul destroying place, and and um, you know, I've I've been able to, um, you know, build an incredible career and and sort of. Uh, make content that goes global um, uh, by living here. So, so look, that may have been accelerated in Los Angeles, and and maybe, uh, but I'll never know. But I'm I'm not sitting around wondering. You'll never do it. Uh, if, if there was a way to to, yep. to take all the kids, then I would. But but right now, bro, like like I said, I'm I'm, I'm heavily involved in um, you know some some initiatives back home, Ngati Pro. Um, and I, I really want to contribute to our country's direction and, right. and I guess do that through the stuff that I'm involved with. So. No, and no, I can't no. do that from Los Angeles. No, okay. Ko huri te ao, he ao hou tēnei. Ko rere ke ngā mahi pa waka wakata. Ko rere ke ngā mahi reo rirangi, ko a ipurangi katoa ngā mahi ai anei. Aye. 
And you've been pretty kind of upfront about your thoughts and critical of some people who express their opinions <laughs> in the media space. You're doing it now. Right? <laughs> uh, what is the biggest challenge? And how do we deal with it? Um, well, I think AI and automation bring uh, an incredible challenge, right? So, um, so talk me through that. What do you, why is well, AI and automation such a challenge? For someone like you as CEO of Pango. Oh, look, to be fair, it's not even about me as CEO of Pango. It's actually about me as a concerned citizen of, of the world. Like, um, you know, uh, look, social media, um, what we, our data sovereignty, um, I think, is under siege. Like, we, we don't have access to our own data sovereignty, or we, we're, we're unable to protect our own data sovereignty in the way we need to. Um, and look, I'm a willing participant in that. Like, I'm on kind of most social media platforms. Um, I'm on, um, so, so you know, I, I, I'm enabling myself to participate in that. So I think, look, I think those are the biggest things that, that will impact kind of where we're headed. Um, I do think there's probably going to be an ethical swing uh, against that, and I think New Zealand, we could play a real role in that, you know, um, because particularly what happened with Christchurch and the mosque and the use of a social media sort of platform like Facebook to be able to, um, the role that that played in, I think, you know, we, we could play a real uh, role in that. So I think that kind of impacts life in general, bro. And then it will obviously impact how, how content works. Because the industry, you know, you got people talking about a mass amalgamation of te reo idirangi o Aotearoa, me te pōaka whakato, TVNZ, me te whakato Māori, yeah. me heipu kotahi e rā mea katoa. How do, you, how do you navigate those tricky waters? Like, what do you do to yeah, find your way through? Because it's going to have an impact on you. It's going to have an impact on content developers and creators all over Aotearoa. Yeah, well, interestingly, two things is... Uh, I get a conference twice a year in France called MIP TV and MIPCOM. Yeah. And there are, the, excuse me, at the last MIPCOM, there was 30% more buyers of content than there was a decade ago. And yet we didn't have Netflix in the form we do now. And we didn't have the, the OTT platforms, the proliferation of OTT platforms that, that is evident now. So, so from a content uh, aggregator point of view, um, actually it's golden times because we have all these publishing mechanisms um, that weren't, weren't around. In the old days, it was linear TV. But for us, so I think the same tenants still exist for us, which is great storytelling, great characters, the ability to execute, um, and understanding what your USP is as a company or, and or individual. Yeah, well, I, I think that um, that's a really interesting point because, you know, ki hoki uh, ki te wā uh, a te karere, uh, ko tētahi o ngā akoranga nui, um, uh, one of the big lessons I had from our te karere days was we were we were on a different floor to the newsroom. And I, I, I kind of was always like, I thought we were like just the same. But actually what it taught me was, is kind of Māori broadcasting at the time was kind of the, the, the little sister or little brother that was kind of outside in the cold and, and sort of, you know, mainstream newsroom was inside by the warm fire. And we were sort of all looking at it and they had all the flash resources and, 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 that, and I was like, oh, shouldn't we be in by the fire? <laughs> like, aren't we meant to be in there? And, and so... So, I th so you're saying we're in, we can be in the fire now? Well, I, I think, I think we've, we've been excluded for too long, yeah. right? That's the first thing I'd say. The second thing is, is that how you get as close to the fire as possible um, can be an individual journey or can be you know, assisted, uh, you know, we've probably talked a lot about how I got closer yeah. to the fire. Um, and so then um, for me, I think that there is a swing uh, of content creation that is direct to consumer that doesn't have kind of uh, a mediator um, editorialising your view. 
Um, so I do think, you know, we do have the ability. Ihu Mato is a classic example where we've seen a movement created, um, you know, largely due to social media initially, mm. and then that's been picked up by mainstream media. So I do think that as Indigenous um, storytellers, that actually we do have mechanisms that aren't sort of controlled by the man uh, anymore. So we do have means to be able to um, actually uh, tell our stories. So what, what do you say to Indigenous content? aggregators, developers who are mm. watching this now, listening to us. What do you say to them? What are your words of advice to them in terms of trying to get closer to the fire? Yeah, it's it's tough because I think it, at times it's an individual one. Um, I had iwi radio. Uh, I had an incredible resource in, in my own sort of backyard. And and um, so, uh, so, so my thing is probably um, have a think about those five Ps. And, and actually, what 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 are you, you know, what do you have in those? And because one of the things I did was I told our staff at Pango to give themselves a score in each of those categories and kind of be truthful about that, that fact. So um, be bold, Jules. I think like we're not, you know, I'm here, you're here, all these cameras are here on the on the shoulders of kind of a whole lot of people who really put their balls on the line or really put everything on the line for us. Nga um, multi-language movement. At times I think I often ask myself, are we too complacent? Um, are we really um, having a dig? I know that I use social media a lot now to actually have a dig. And, Why? And it, Why do you do that? Uh, um, because... Are you just trying to be provocative? Nah. Oh look, I think there's an element of provocation, but there's also an element of influence in that because I now know that when I know people that you know have read it and that, that becomes uh, you know it perhaps it perhaps uh, helps inform what they think about it or it might be just like oh no he's having another go yeah. but actually for me I, I'm really purposeful on it because I I kind of feel that um, you know the older you get the more kind of runs on the board you have. Um, the more you kind of figure out um, how things work, that you should use that. And uh, and legitimately, um, I don't, I, you know, I'm always one that's up for a scrap. Um, but also, um, those are, you know, my genuine thoughts. Yeah. Okay. Kia ora how did they hapa hara nui ra nei o te ahoe te nei ao? Nogi te nei ao. Biggest regret. Um, um, you can be honest? Or you yeah, yeah, yeah. No, no, no. Um, oh look, I, I spoke about it earlier, which was, I guess the the um, entitlement. I, I guess I had when I left Maori TV. Um, I'd written high. Um, I'd had success, and I, and I kind of thought that you know whatever I turned my hand to would would be amazing. Um, so I definitely think that period, bro, is, uh, I have a lot of regrets um, uh, around that time because I guess the thing is, is that you then kind of go into a siege mentality and if the world and, and actually um, you start to, you know, um, you know, hate people and, and things like that. So, you know, definitely not, not proud of the way I acted. Um, at times during that period and and you know the level of kind of like I said entitlement and arrogance um, and, and you know I spoke about ego earlier like you know really understanding kind of what what drives that that ego is an important part and so, so what do you say to people because right? you said you've said that a couple of times in this quarter or what do you say to people who think you are an egotistical yeah whakahihi, yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not saying that's my view, I'm just saying that that's what gets circulated. No, no, no. Um, my thing would be is, first of all, I'm a work in progress, like all of us. So what does that mean? Uh, I think, mate, like anyone, you just, you have to constantly work on yourself and, and, and probably put in those checks and balances. And, and for me, a lot of that's about being involved in stuff at home, right? Ngāti Pro. Ngāti Pro. And, and, you know, that may be um, my single contribution to the world, no. is what I do um, at home. And spending more time with the kids, because ultimately that's, that's what, what it's all for, right? Um, 
But I definitely think, Bo, that, you know, you've got to be, uh, I, I think you've got to understand that. You've got to understand the source of your behaviour. And I think too, Jules, that, that actually on top of all of that, though, um, still be quite clear about what your purpose is. Because you also there's also a part of, uh, you know, being quite unforgiving about that too, right? Because ultimately, um, and I go back to like, so I spent a lot of my life trying to please people, and then you uh, you just realise you're never going to win everyone over. No. So there are always going to be people that 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 hate you. There are always going to be people that love you. And then you, uh, I guess, you know, you can't name me somebody that has universal appeal uh yeah I'm, I'm not sure and so so i guess you know recognizing behaviors but also understanding the fact bro that not every, you're not going to please everyone yeah when and, you when you're in like la and france and all that stuff are you constantly pinching yourself going man not bad for a kai t boy uh, <laughs> coming all this way and doing what i'm doing and bro i'd be i'd honestly be lying if i said i didn't yeah. um and how was, often do you do it um, probably not as much as people would think because I, I guess when, when you're an active participant in something, um, you know, whether it was, let's say you're an all black, um, you know, if you kind of, you know, stop to pinch yourself during a game, you, you might miss that tackle yeah. or you might drop that ball. Um, and I guess that's kind of my attitude too. I'm an active participant. I'm, I'm still in this career. I'm still on this ride, so if I stop to think about it, I might drop the ball. I might miss the tackle, uh, which I was really good at at rugby anyway. <laughs> so, so I don't actually want to uh, want to do that. Um, so, so, um, so yeah. So I, I actually think that you know I'm still in it, so it's really hard to kind of yeah. like stop and take it. And, and to be fair, bro, legitimately think. Hopefully my best mahi is in front of me, yeah. you know, and my best contribution to to that what I said earlier, Maori development is still ahead of me, bro. Ki te tūtaki koe ki a Bailey Mackie e rua te kau o na tau, he hana ma tau kore ro ki aia? Oh, this is taking ages, this yeah. is interesting. Oh, look, I think if, if I met a 20 year old Bailey Mackie, I'd be like, Tum Tomorrow starts today, and you know the decisions that you make today will impact the rest of your life. So, be really clear and considered about those decisions because twenty-year-old Bailey Mackey didn't, you know, was was in a lot of respects lost. I I, I left school with no qualifications. I went. I managed to somehow get into teachers' training college. Then I left no qualifications, then I went to Auckland University, no qualifications that I left there. Um, so, you know, I still have no qualifications and and, it, and so that's why I'd say to a 20 year old Bailey Mackey is actually sit down and just be a bit more considered um, in what you're doing because, you know, I used to wear it as a badge of honour that I had no qualifications until my son didn't want to go to school one day and then he said, oh, you've got no qualifications. Why should I go to school? <laughs> and then uh, I was like, OK, uh, I'm, first of all, I'm going to ask him to take that YouTube video down. <laughs> uh, and uh, secondly, um, I, I, I'd, I'd love to study again yeah. um, because I think I'm, I'm, I'm probably, uh, at my age of 43, the maturity of a 20-year-old Bailey Mackey anyway. So I'm probably ready to go to university now or something. Ready to study. Bro, e mihi ana. E mihi ana e nei kōrero. Te nā koe whai wahi mai koe kia mātou me te... Me te e hoa te kōrero pono. Ne? Mm. E kōrero pono mai koe kia mātou e pāna ki o wāku whakāro e e rā mea katoa. Ki, hei, whaka, hei whakarā pōpoto i tātā, hei taupoki aki i tātā mai kōrero. Me hei mei i a koe te tikanga, ka kōrero koe i tētahi mea pai i o te a koe i te nei ao. Big a success. The one thing, what is it? Biggest success yeah. so far? Yeah. Or, or biggest uh, success so far in your life? Mm, well, hopefully my biggest is still to come, would be my first thing, bro. Like, in that, like, I think, you know, hopefully my greater, you know, I'll contribute. Um, to be fair, and I know a lot of people would say this, just 
the uh, children. Like, I see a different part of myself in the kids. Um, and I think my role, bro, is, and to go back to it, like, I, I really kind of um, probably, um, you know, didn't articulate properly, but I think, you know, the biggest role that I can play in my children's life is just to give them really good, the ability to make good choices and to make better choices than I did um, at times, particularly around education, bro. Like, um, you know, and, and which is kind of why in some ways I'm, I'm, I'm quite hard on them in that regard and probably harder than anyone ever was on me. Um, yeah. But, but, but m you know, my greatest success, I think, would be, um, you know, just giving my kids better choices um, about uh, things. And, you know, but from a career point of view, uh, putting up with you. Well, you, well you'll, know, you'll note I've, I've gone through all my questions. <laughs> things haven't changed, bro. No matter how things change, they always stay the same. Now, uh, the thing was, though, is that, mate, uh, I always just did my work ethic juice, so nothing's changing. Hey, Emiliano, we'll be far away, my queen. Tēnā, bro. Tēnā, bro. Bye, dude.